Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, writers, scientists, educators, social scientists, government leaders. We speak with each one to one. I'm delighted to welcome writer, social activist, and Reverend Donna Scopper, Senior Minister of the Judson Memorial Church in the heart of Greenwich Village, a landmark with a unique history, mission, and congregation, and a touchstone for many of us. We'll explore its rich history and the life and work of the Reverend Scopper, who has an equally rich narrative to explore as well. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I visited Judson Memorial Church about two years ago mm -hmm. and realized immediately that it was unlike any other church I had ever visited. <laughs> very liberal. I seem to have stumbled into a lot of aging members of the hippie generation, mm -hmm. a large gay presence, socially and politically activist. Mm -hmm. uh, it seemed to have a significant arts, theater, and music program. And But most striking, the first church I've been to where they serve beer and wine at the after church supper. <laughs> so <laughs> where did this come from? Oh, goodness. <laughs> You know, it, I think it came from the environment in which we live, Greenwich Village. Um, it's Churches are always impacted by their community. So if you're a church in Ohio, you're going to be like that community. If you're a church in Greenwich Village, surrounded by NYU on all corners, you're going to be like that. So pin it so, on NYU, huh? No, not, <laughs> not NYU, my best neighbor. Pin it on Greenwich Village. But, you know, the thing you didn't mention in that lovely litany of how it looked to you, uh, I love that, um, is that we also don't display a cross, and we are a Christian church, because the old cross has been made into a large central table. Okay. Intentionally around which we gather. And the reason for that, uh, we also don't keep a Bible in the meeting room. Um, the reason for everything, be the only thing you can't move is the big table, but the community is in and out of our space, our sacred space, 24-7. Uh, and anything you leave up there moves. Mm -hmm. So we kept losing the cross, and finally we decided we were going to make it into something you can't move. So okay. <laughs> you can't move it. And when it's time for worship <coughs> service, we bring the Bible in, because otherwise it walks out with somebody. Wow. It's one of, it was originally a Baptist church. Yes. One of two Baptist churches that I know of that were mm -hmm. built with the philanthropy of John D. Rockefeller, who was yes. a well-known Baptist. Yes. Uh, the other being Riverside Church, yes. um, which is also known for its social activism. But it's not Baptist now, is it? It, a, it still is Baptist. Is it really? Very much. So is Riverside. Riverside and Judson were, ba were built in the same period, the 1890s. Uh, when John D. Rockefeller had money to burn and wanted to erect um, a mo monuments to American Baptist faith, which is a beautiful faith, and we're very much still that. American Baptists split off during the Civil after the Civil War for reasons of slavery, um, the right kind of reasons, so the Northern Baptists became the American Baptists. But in 1951, we joined another uh, even more liberal denomination, uh, which is called the United Church of Christ. This is the original pilgrim uh, denomination, which now has merged with three others, thus the name United Church of Christ. We're most famous for the God is Still Speaking campaign. And in 1951, uh, again, owing to the, um, the great foresight of the Greenwich Village community, Judson was already very gay friendly in the 50s, uh, before Stonewall. And the American Baptists weren't. In fact, frankly, they still aren't. Right. And so, I mean, they'll get there. It's just a question of time. <clears throat> but the United Church of Christ is very gay friendly. And so we became a double denomination okay. over that issue. Okay. Now, when the church was finished in the, I think, 1893, mm -hmm. it was a church that was built to serve poor immigrants, most of them Italian at the time, but right in the midst mm -hmm. of a wealthy WASP community? Well, no, downtown wasn't no? what it is now. Okay. But there indeed was up Fifth Avenue money, then the park, and then you crossed into downtown, and 
uh, Rockefeller very much wanted us to be a little different, and we are. Uh, our little tagline is we're a church that's a little bit different and tending to make a big difference in the world and in people's lives. When Rockefeller uh, built Judson, I think he might have intended to be residential in the same way that Riverside was and to serve the uptowners. Right. But the first minister they called uh, was a very prophetic person, and he said, hello, I'm looking downtown. I'm not looking uptown. Mm -hmm. And what he saw downtown were the first waves of Italian immigrants who are, were being uh, <laughs> called names. They were dirty. They were too sexy. They were ruining the country. Sound familiar to anything that's going on now? And so Judson actually had the first clean water on in downtown, and that's our fountain. On the, we're literally redoing uh, it right now because it's been broken a long mm -hmm. time. It was the baptismal font, again, American Baptists then. But uh, Mr. Judson, the first Judson, was different than John D. would have wanted uh, and, and made his case. And we actually owned that whole block. We had a hotel that was designed to support the ministry. We taught cooking lessons. Americanizing cooking lessons to Italian immigrants and tried to talk them out of their garlic eating ways because they smelled of garlic. But the thing we're most proud of is that living fountain of genuinely mm -hmm. clean, healthy water right. on the Lower East Side. I would say that on a cooking end, the Italians won because Italian food <laughs> is now really, really popular. At it, a time, it was German food, and nobody, because Germans were upper class, and nobody eats German food anymore, no. hardly. No, the Italians <laughs> very much won that battle. Through the years, Justin has operated, seemed to have operated a rather avant-garde type of ministry. Mm -hmm. In 1895, it opened a kind of shelter for the poor. Mm -hmm. In the 20s, it started a health center. In the 40s and 60s, it ran an interracial, international residence for students. Mm -hmm. At one point in the 60s, it opened the first drug treatment clinic in the village. Mm -hmm. In the 70s, before Roe v. Wade, it ran an abortion counseling and referral services, mm -hmm. and later a low-cost abortion clinic. And in the 70s and 80s, it conducted a ministry to street prostitutes. Mm -hmm. This obviously would have had to come, you, you, you talked about the first minister, it would have had to have come from the leadership of the ministers of the church. Absolutely. Uh, in, indeed, we have been blessed with tremendous leaders. And most of the things you named happened under the leadership of Howard Moody, mm -hmm. who is today 91 years old. Oh, alive. he's alive. He's alive. He, and he's really more than alive. He, oh. is, he worships with us, he and his wife, Lori. Uh, and Howard was there for 35 years, uh, through most of that period, and has a wonderful uh, book out about his life okay. there and then. He hired a man named Al Carmines. He was musically avant-garde, created Off-Broadway, created um, a new kind of modern dance. Judson, because of its location and its theology, it's, a, it's both, has always opened its doors to people who were about movements and people who are about 20 or 30 years ahead of their time. Uh, now, you never know if you're really doing that, because we probably had as many unsuccessful openings <laughs> as we had successful openings. But um, modern dance, off-Broadway, um, Rauschenbusch, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all worked at Judson collaboratively. And, and where are they perform? Are they performing in the sanctuary or someplace else? Where are they performing? All over the place. Okay. Uh, in the gym at Judson, which is downstairs from the sanctuary, Howard Moody moved the chairs, the pews out in 1959, which meant that we could do lots of different things. In that, um, as the administrator of the space, that overuse of the space <laughs> is remains our habit. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's space for people who can't afford yet to find a place in this great city. Space is a real premium here, so we give a lot of it away. I'm interested in the abortion counseling and referral service because yes. I know that before abortion, even before abortion became legal in 1970, there was a network <clears throat> of sort of underground mm -hmm. physicians referral service to mm -hmm. refer women to doctors, legitimate doctors who performed abortions. Was that your, that your kind of referral services or was this strictly Howard, Howard Moody 
was the president of what was called Clergy Consultation. I was a seminarian in Chicago and belonged to the network. Um, so on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I would counsel women from four till eight in church basements about whether or not they should fly to New York to have an abortion. It was a national network. Howard was its president and founder. And he not only did the politics to make abortion legal, he also did the social services because we were still looking at a lot of coat hangers then. And so his work was to talk doctors and nurses into, into performing abortions that wouldn't kill you. Right, right. And, and also, I think his most prophetic work with the abortion movement, and now that I've read much more about it, I was just a, a kid doing this thing. And there were very few women clergy anywhere uh, back then. And so they wanted women. I mean, can you imagine having to sit down and talk to a man about this is how you have an abortion, this is what, you know. Um, it's difficult, especially then. Now women, I think, are freer to discuss mm -hmm. topics mm -hmm. uh, relating to their bodies. Then they weren't. But the main thing Howard did was when abortion became legal, he knew that this was going to become an expensive event for women. Why? Because that's how the healthcare system works. And he took his referral network and said, we will keep the prices down. So you won't get referrals from us unless you do it for 350 And the second it became legal, even good doctors, even good hospitals said the price will be 450 And Howard hung on with that, keeping it a reasonable price. He finally lost the battle. As, as we all know, health care is not something anybody is trying to give away in this country. But I thought that was in a way the most prophetic part mm -hmm. of that whole ministry because we know... Now was he a Baptist minister or was he a United Church? He's very or much American Baptist. Wow. Former, <coughs> former Marine. Uh-huh. Guy with a crew cut. Oh, you know, masculine in a way that makes you wonder why he picked up with so many women's issues because prostitution and abortion were the key issues mm -hmm. that he worked on. Interesting. We're going to take a short break, then we'll be back with the Reverend Donna Scopper of the Justin Memorial Church right after the following message. Take out meals for just twelve ninety nine. Call them. Sherry Pearson. You are the sole surviving heir of the King of Montanopolis, and you are now worth $45 million. Real? Of course it's not real. Come on. Having money isn't about luck. Like that takeout meal. Cook at home instead, you can save thousands a year. Feed me. Feed the pig. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with the Reverend Donna Scopper of the Judson Memorial Church. So what drew you to Judson? Oh my, um, Judson might be the very best job for a United Church of Christ minister, which I am, in the world. Uh, why? It's theologically more open and it's, I get to learn from people. I'm almost 40 years in the ordained ministry and every one of my congregations thought I was too liberal for them. Um, and Judson think In previous yes, congregations. Yes. And I've had seven previous congregations, and uh, I wanted to be a place where, in a place where they thought I was co too conservative. And Judson thinks I'm too, <laughs> I'm too conservative. Now, am I right? now your husband is—is is he Jewish? Is yes. Your husband Jewish? Yes. How does that work out? Sort of like Amir mm -hmm. Madlin and James Carville? Uh, uh, beautifully. <laughs> We raised three kids both ways. Uh, two of my kids are practicing Jews. Uh, one is appropriately at age 26, uh, and I don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, my son is actually married to a woman who's becoming a rabbi. Okay. And has given me my first grandchild. Wow, there you go. <laughs> so tell me about some of the projects the church is currently involved in. I mean, on the day I was there, you were welcoming back a Haitian immigrant who had just barely escaped being deported. Mm -hmm. We are very involved with the immigrant rights movement right now. Uh, I would say that's our main uh, main squeeze, and we we run an accompaniment. Is that the New Sanctuary Coalition? That's the New Sanctuary <coughs> Movement, which provides sanctuary, which we define as safe space, 
um, including taking in people who the government is trying to deport. And so we fight for people. Individually, we run an accompaniment program, which your listeners might be very interested in doing. So many people say, I want to do something, but I don't know how. It's a great thing to accompany an immigrant to his or her ICE check-ins and get to know them and see what's really going on with immigrants. So we run that program, we train people, we do this in cooperation with NYU next door, the law school, which is a great cooperation. And we also do a lot of advocacy for the DREAM Act, for uh, comprehensive immigration reform. In New York City, we have partnered with many other wonderful organizations to keep secu so-called secure communities out of here, which is all, it's just a law enforcement program that tries to throw people out, mm -hmm. as though that would make us secure. Fortunately, Governor Cuomo is very much against having so-called secure communities in New York, and so we applaud Is that where work. you, what is, I'm not sure I understand what a secure community is. It secure communities is a program by ICE that basically would get more money to round up more people. I see. And deport them so that other people would think they were secure as though the premise is wrong. Immigrants are not a threat to your security. Right, right. Immigrants uh, help you. They raise your children, they pick your lettuce, they wash your strawberries, they take care of your elderly, they create businesses, they are an economic boon, not bane. You also tra you train ministers for, is it for community ministry? Yes. Is it, is, tell me about that. Well, that's probably my <coughs> favorite project. Uh, we take uh, around 10 students a year from New York Theological, Union Seminary, Drew University, Rutgers, local seminaries, and we give them a year internship at Judson to train them in how to do public ministry from a parish base. So we don't just teach activism and we don't just teach pastoral ministry, we teach them together. We have 49 graduates over six years of this program. And it really, I tell people, this is my seed corn program. I don't know if you're aware of the horrible things the Spanish did to the Incans when they colonized them. They didn't just destroy their food, they also destroyed their seed corn. I think the American Protestant parish um, has been so privatized and is so interested in people's souls as opposed to their bodies. Mm -hmm. that That's the reason most congregations, Judson very much excluded, are losing members because people know that their job satisfaction and their human rights are connected to their spiritual lives. So we try to bring them together and we teach students how to do that. And now, training. If you, you certainly saw a lot of social activism by ministers in the 60s and 70s. I'm thinking, mm -hmm. well, obviously, you know, Martin Luther King, William Sloan Coffin at Riverside. I'm mm -hmm. thinking about Bishop Paul Moore in Jersey City and then later mm -hmm. at St. John the Divine. Mm -hmm. But is, is, is that going on today to the same, you don't hear about it in the way you're used to it. Maybe it's just you don't have the big names. It's very much going on at Judson. <clears throat> it's very much going on at Riverside. It's going on on a lot of our neighbor churches in New York. We have about 30 congregations involved with the sanctuary movement. It has experienced some decline. Uh, and I never know if Protestantism experienced the decline and then activism did, or if activism itself, which is in decline and changing. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll, this is the best way I can say to you. There's nothing in decline about Judson Memorial Church. We have to put out extra chairs. We are growing. We've transferred power and leadership to a younger generation. We're becoming more diverse. We're Did, unusual. I would imagine, well, are there people who criticize you for <clears throat> being more political, about political and social activism than about religion? There are definitely <clears throat> people who do that. Uh, when we... Uh, we're the first people to defend the rights of uh, the Cordova Center to build downtown and organized on behalf of our neighbor. We got picketed for a while uh, for being involved with politics instead of religion. And I was, all I could say was I was bemused. Um, we have a tradition of whenever Judson is picketed to serve coffee and donuts to the picketers on the front step. It's just a thing. And uh, they would say that we were being political and I thought, my goodness, sacred space, a mosque, is religious. 
uh, it's not political. And uh, here, here would be my answer, Cheryl, and it's an important one. I was the first woman trained by Saul Alinsky to do community organizing in Chicago. There were three of us in that period. And we did great stuff. But we finally didn't like community organization because it was too biased towards power and agency and biased against community and vulnerability. And you'll begin to hear the feminist critique of community organizing. The great thing that's happening in New York City and nationwide is clerical power is moving to women. And women are changing churches to be what I would call both and, both sources of community and sources of political, social, religious power. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I, I want to hear more about that, how women are changing, you know, churches and communities let, let me in a way that men, well, male uh, activist ministers didn't. I don't want to put down, <coughs> down men or uh, activist ministers. They're, most of them are my mentors and my friends. Uh, I do want to, my personal mission statement is to provide spiritual nurture for public capacity. And if all I'm doing is organizing immigrants for their rights at City Hall and getting ICE out of Rikers, which is another thing that we do, because ICE picks up a couple hundred people a week at Rikers. Uh, These are the immigration people. Yeah. Right. Who haven't done anything but a traffic ticket half the time. So if all I'm doing is advocating for people, and not growing their souls and their spirits, I'm in trouble. If all I'm doing is growing their souls and spirits and helping them get through breast cancer, helping them get through unemployment, which is the biggest part of my job right now, people are ashamed that they're unemployed. They'll say, Psst, I gotta tell you something, I lost my job. And, and I'll say, oh my God, why, why be ashamed right, of that? Right, right. So I try to hold, and many women do, um, the personal and the political, the self and the society together in some dynamic, mutually empowering interchange. Your new book, and you've written 31, I gather, is called A Religious Renegade's Thank You to Organized Religion. Are you a religious renegade and why a thank you? <laughs> Organized religion <laughs> saved my life. Um, when I was... Uh, Six years old, uh, my father beat up my mother. I have come to discover that I'm not the only one who ever experienced this. Uh, of course, then, that's what I thought. Somehow, this was back when the phone numbers were uh, seven numbers. I dialed EV742 something. And I said, Pastor Witte, uh, you have to come over here, um, do something about this. And he showed up. And in that moment, I said, I'm going to keep girls safe, little girls safe. How old were you? Six. Okay. And then I always, uh, they always made fun of me for baptizing my dolls and feeding them communion. Uh, but that's what I did. And it has been the very best job in the world. Uh, so I thank organized religion, whether they're evangelical or fundamentalists or punishmentalists or liberals for saving not my life. The beating didn't stop. Um, nothing really changed except that I felt safe. And I have always felt spiritually protected and safe by church. Yeah, I'm a renegade. I'm, I'm a very open-minded, progressive liberal and a feminist. And I know many Christians think that's going to send me straight to hell. I think it's going to send me straight to heaven and already has. Okay. <laughs> well, it's certainly, an, as, I, as I said earlier, it's certainly a fascinating church and uh, I'd like to come back and enjoy a beer on, set on Sunday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> you are Maybe welcome. some wine. <laughs> We're out of time, but I want to thank the Reverend Donna Scopper, Senior Minister of the Judson Memorial Church. If you'd like to learn more about Judson's programs or to participate, you'll find lots of information at the website at judson.org. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.